Hello, my name is Noel Bell, and in this podcast, I'm chatting with Tommy Hinken about his article Quantum Leaps in the Evolution of Therapeutic Hypnosis, in which he argues that contemporary psychotherapy owes a debt of gratitude to the history of hypnosis that has not been generally acknowledged. The article can be downloaded at jamesbraidsociety.com. I started the interview by asking Tommy about the origins of his name and indeed how to correctly pronounce his name. Well, no, it's, there's a little story. There's always a little story, isn't there? Um, and it's a lovely way, actually, um, that I often use when I'm starting work with a new group is to ask people just to tell me about their names. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to, I think, establish identity and uh, you get so much rich information about what their name means, if it means anything, or what it means to them, and you know, yep. is there a, a story, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, my name is actually Hinchen, which is a H A with an umlaut N C H E N, and that, if you might recognise it, is a Austrian German name, and Hinchen means little chicken. Right. I'd, I'd rather it was like big chicken, <laughs> yeah. but it happens to be little chicken. My parents came to this country, they're, they're long gone, uh, they died 20 years ago or so, but they came here as immigrants after the Second World War, right. and they got kind of tired of yeah. um, coaching people how to pronounce the yeah. name properly, so it became Anchen. Right. Um, and there's a further dimension to the story, if you will, Noel, in as much as um, my father was born in Poland but of Austrian German parents, my mother was through and through and through Polish. They got together in Palestine as the war was ending, right, and came here, of course, to settle. And there was no great love between the Germans and the Poles after the Second World War and indeed before indeed. even though um, many Germans were Polish speaking and many Poles who are living on the Austro-German borders were German speaking as well yeah. uh, but of course after the war things changed dramatically so what I'm saying is that I grew up in a household where the name became anglicised to Anchen but actually um, there was a Polish version of the name, mm-hmm. and the Polish version of the name was Hen Hen. Uh, so, in order to kind of disguise its German origins, right? So, if Poland Tommy has a fascinating Hinchen. history in, in European, absolutely. well, and a very traumatic history in European yes. history yes. in terms of being sandwiched between the empires. Yeah. Before we talk about why. Um, you became a therapist, uh, how you became a therapist mm. and what mm. your particular interests mm. were. Do you see any resonance with transgenerational trauma around your Polish background? Uh, yes, yes indeed. And I've been absolutely fascinated with the way uh, transgenerational trauma is, is, is surfacing and gaining more and more attention. Um, even to the point where just the other day I was kind of like thinking gosh how far back are we having to look now in yeah. order to understand why we are who we are today yeah. and um, in a way I was finding myself become quite cynical really and thinking um, I'm more interested in what's happening now and in the future uh, how far back do we have to really go to understand and recognising that that's quite dismissive mm. uh, because I grew up in a house where, um, well, I was born in the uh, early 50s and uh, uh, into a family who absolutely um, had encountered all kinds of uh, very, very real, very dramatic threats. Uh, both my parents were uprooted in their teens from their homes, never to return. Mm. My mother ended up uh, as a prisoner in a labour camp in Siberia for a good part of the war. And my father um, was uh, given the choice of being a prisoner of war in the German army or wearing a German uniform because he was recognised as a German speaker who happened to be born in Poland. Right. So he 
at 16 joined the German army and then halfway through his war when the Allies were succeeding and his uh, German uh, battalion uh, uh, were taken by the English he was given the same choice but this time it was either you become an English prisoner of war as a German soldier right. or you can join the Polish Free Army who are based in Palestine so he's decided to join the Polish Free Army now as a child I could never understand how my father apparently fought on both sides <laughs> but I grew up in a house where the, uh, the, the threat the possibility of it all ending was imminent and certainly uh, the anxiety and the depressions the, of, of the loss and the grief that both my parents and, and their parents, my grandparents experienced was, was very much a part of my, my upbringing and uh, as a young lad growing up I tended to really resent my mixed heritage and the fact that I wasn't English mm -hmm. um, and then when I got into my teens and as I've grown older I've become extremely proud and possessive yeah. of my heritage I guess that might be the way for many people sure yeah how, I mean one of the obvious questions we're going to chat yeah. about is how did you become a therapist okay and maybe why well again we're, we're back to uh, generational even transgenerational stuff because I think so much of who I am now um, I can track back to who my mother was mm -hmm. and my mother happened to be one of these people in the uh, Polish community where we were brought up uh, in England as a real helper, as a real giver. I had a mum who was always looking to help the vulnerable people in the mm -hmm. community as much as she could and hold down a full-time job and be a mother of two children and two half-brothers who were in, in, in reality uh, my first cousins who were orphaned during the war and then informally, mm -hmm. unofficially adopted by my parents. Uh, so, if you will, there were four siblings, mm -hmm. and um, my mum was was mum, but she was also working full time in a factory, and she was also a very prominent figure in the local community, and and someone who mm -hmm. people naturally went to for help and assistance. <laughs> I smile when I think about it with some embarrassment, but um, I remember being asked as a child. In, I think this was in my secondary school now, but I just kind of started, or maybe it was in late primary school years. So what do you want to be? A teacher's asking me when you grow up. And I'm kind of very clear. Well, it's one of two things. I either want to be a priest, thinking about my mum and the good work that she's done, etc., and kind of wanting to honour that, and maybe eh, maybe that was me as well, or a fashion photographer. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Quite a spectrum there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how come I've ended up doing what I do now, being what I am now? A lot of the kind of the caring, the helping, the healing side, I believe, originated from my mother. The other thing I kind of figured out a long time ago, really, was um, I used to enjoy taking a lot of drugs when I was in my teens. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely fascinated with drugs and with the whole lifestyle. And so here we're talking about the 60s, mm -hmm. mid to late 60s and very early 70s. The swinging 60s. All of that mm -hmm. and some. And my parents were great. They, um, it was like, son, we don't care what you do, but one thing we know is that education will be the answer. So whatever you do, just all we want of you is to go as far as you can with your education. Well, I wasn't really successful at school and I kind of left at 16 with, uh, well, barely scraped through the GCSEs as we had them at the time. Mm -hmm. But then I went to a, a kind of local college and I did an ordinary national diploma and my parents are saying, look, we don't mind what you do, really. You do what you like, but, you know, just find something and, and go as far as you can with the education. And now, that might sound rather gentle. In fact, at home, it wasn't, you know, it was, there's was like a three-line whip, you know. Yeah, you, you've got to carry on. You've got to carry on studying. You've got to carry on studying as far as you can, but whatever it is, whatever it is. So, well, I, I don't want to disappoint my parents, and it, it kind of makes sense. And, of course, in those days it was uh, just a different world in terms of higher education, mm -hmm. grants and support, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I knew that I had just about enough qualifications to, to, 
to uh, get onto a degree course. So what do I want to do? Well, back in those days, in the early 70s, social work was a, was a, a sexy, sexy in terms of popular, fashionable. It was a, a, a kind of a real kind of fashionable profession. And then there was psychology, and I was kind of interested in, you know, what goes on and this drug thing as well, you know, altering mental states, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, I know, I want to work with drug addicts. But I think I went to work with drug addicts because I was kind of interested in drugs. But I, that kind of, that seemed to uh, hit the spot. So I decided I was going to be a social worker. Anyway, off I go to college and eventually I completed my training and I'm really grateful for it because it's, it's stood me well over time. So I, I had a career in social work. Then I decided to embark on the road to psychotherapy. Um, and I was introduced to the work of Carl Rogers and Jared Egan and the person-centred approach, mm -hmm. which blew me away. So my first orientation was deeply rooted in that humanistic, person-centred, yep. Rogerian approach. What I began to study was neuro-linguistic programming. So now we're talking about the early 90s, and NLP had only recently uh, come over to this country from America mm -hmm. and it was all the rage and certainly in, in, in any kind of training forums whether it's uh, in the statutory sector or in the private sector in the commercial sector everybody's talking about NLP mm -hmm. it was the new kid on the block mm -hmm. and it was the solution and the answer to everything it was this new system of communication it was this new system of achieving excellence in any discipline in any area and I was immediately attracted to it mm -hmm. uh, and I started off doing my introductions and my practitioner training and then I completed my master practitioner training and that whole process probably took about four years um, and I funded myself of course because I was working independently I thoroughly enjoyed the trainings mm -hmm. and I was introduced to the work of mm -hmm. uh, Milton Erickson yep. uh, from whom so much of uh, contemporary uh, NLP and now we talk about neuro-linguistic psychotherapy and I was part of a group of people in the 90s, in the mid-90s and um, who actually were really interested in NLP but had social work or care mm. or therapeutic counselling type backgrounds mm -hmm. and we thought, well, why don't we establish a neuro-linguistic psychotherapeutic community? Mm. So we did and it was the first one in the world and it's alive and well in this country and I've I've always been part of the kind of uh, the, the the committee, and these days I'm their supervision registrar. So it's kind of my responsibility, my brief to um, accredit um, and register our supervisors, and, okay. and and attend to all matters pertaining to supervision for people who have gone through that orientation. And NLPT, Neuro Linguistic Psychotherapy, um, is a member of the UK. United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy and um, yeah, we have delegated authority to uh, train and accredit and register our own therapists who then become registered with UKCP so yeah. kind of that that's and, and uh, along all that time now all, I, I, you know it was countless CPD and I've had a lifelong interest in hypnosis but again mm. that probably comes back to my uh, fascination and curiosity about altered states of consciousness yeah. and drugs. <laughs> yeah, which, which then kind of fits in with the transpersonal because yeah. uh, we mentioned that before we started recording about the uh, the whole issue of soul and transcendence yeah. states and that the soul has its own journey and then we have different levels of consciousness. Where are you in all that? So if people talk about a soul journey incarnating into the body and then has a journey through the earth plane and developing an ego and learning how to deal with the what's needed in the world of how to defend and gather and nourish to then developing a set of skills to deal with the world and then develop their inner sacredness. I mean, when you hear that, what, what, what resonates with you? So much, so much. It, uh, just that I might use a different language. Right, okay. But I think 
ultimately or essentially, if you will, we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the language I use actually comes again from uh, something I discovered in my teens, and that was the work of Wilhelm Reich. Okay. Um, With the body and... Absolutely, absolutely. I've read most of Wilhelm Reich's work, and I've read as much as I can about the stuff that's been written about him. And there is a view that, uh, and I know that indeed in... I don't know whether it's true now, but there was a time in in the training of psychiatrists that they were told that, yeah, you know, read read Wilhelm Reich's work Mm -hmm. up to this point, but after this point, the man went mad. Mm. So you can miss everything else that you you wrote. Actually, I think after that point, which is probably around the time that he was incarcerated in American in American prison and his work became so threatening to the establishment because he was taught he was kind of like really um, buying um, well the hippies I was a hippie in, mm. at some point in my later adolescence mm. really bought into this kind of like, let's make love not war and you know it's all about orgasm and, mm. and the function of the orgasm there was a film made uh, you know it was kind of the orgone accumulator which kind of really gets you going and everything else I uh, built one of my own so I mean it really appealed to my kind of sensibilities at the time yep. the work of Wilhelm Reich and I still believe uh, Wilhelm Reich is, uh, you know, an absolutely underrated genius, a man yeah. of his time, and whose time has not yet come. Yeah. But Wilhelm Reich mm. um, would talk about the life force, and I absolutely believe in a life force. Yeah. And for me, when I hear talk about transcendental work, um, and I talk about soul journeys, um, I think about the life force, and I believe that. Uh, uh, I have a life force that exists within me and that was there before this this self was created and born and that the life force will remain after this self dies. Okay. Yep, that's um, pretty much the yeah. same sort of, sort of sort of language and I also very if I can <clears throat> cut in here sure. before I forget uh, very much influenced by Jung's work on the archetypes. And I do yeah. believe, if you will, you know, maybe it's uh, 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 the different archetypal energies uh, that flow through us, I think, are universal. And his work, uh, when he talks about alchemical journeying. Yes. and Yeah. You're listening to an interview with Tommy Hinken with me, Noel Bell. This is where recently, I mean, th- there's been so much, as you know, advances in neuroscience and yes. with fMRI scanning that show things about neural pathways that we didn't yeah. know before yeah. and yeah. seems to back up what the Buddhists have been saying around yeah. mental force that yes. that creates positive absolutely neural pathways so what I wanted to backtrack a little with you was your interest with mesmer yes because you have a paper on and it's on hypnosis and yeah. the history of from Mesmer to James Bray to Ernest Rossi. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, because yeah. we yeah. when we say we've been mesmerized that yeah. apparently comes from mesmer. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we're referring to some kind of altered state, some yeah. kind of trance state. Uh, you know, driving through relentless snow or rain or absolutely being mesmerised when we're watching something so fascinating uh, that we kind of develop some kind of altered state, absolutely. So is this linked to NLP? Absolutely, absolutely. So this is where your interest in NLP coincided with you then getting in touch with ideas for mesmer. Now we're talking pre-French Revolution? Uh, yes, seventeen sixty uh, seventy seven about, about eight, yeah. that time. About that time, and and just for the record, it's the James Braid Society. Yeah. Uh, dot com, and yeah, there's a link to the essays, and there's a number of uh, contributions okay. that you can you can access online. And yep. I wrote an essay a few years ago, like two thousand and nine, perhaps two thousand and six. I can't remember which year now. It doesn't matter, of course, but it's uh, quantum leaps in the evolution of contemporary psychotherapy. Okay. And it's my contention that we really haven't given enough credit to where, in my view, psychotherapy and the talking therapies started 
I believe they started more around the time and the work that Mesmer was doing than what we would normally say is that it all started with the likes of Freud and Young at the turn of the last century. Yes, because people assume take it's a maybe it's a misconception that modern talking yeah. therapy yeah. comes from Freud. Yeah. And he yeah. didn't discover the unconscious. He explored it. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely no. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, <laughs> sounds rather grand and pompous in, in a way, but yeah, I just felt that this was a uh, this was an error that needs correcting. Yeah. yeah. And that there's so much more we can learn by going back and uh, understanding uh, how people were practicing talking therapy 200 years ago. And actually when I did just that, I started to see incredible similarities with what we're doing now, which kind of makes you think, well, have we really advanced that much? What we know how to help in that healing way through a talking therapy. So I, I, I took three, three, three characters, Mesmer to begin with, uh, the 1700s, the mid 1700s. Yeah. Then I took James Braid, uh, practicing in the mid to late 1800s, and Ernest Rossi, who I've had the great privilege of uh, working with for many years uh, uh, as a student. When yep. he would visit this and country. some of his interviews are on YouTube, I've noticed. Yes, yeah. that's right, that's right. Um, and Ernest Rossi, of course, is probably the person that spent more time and written and documented preserved the work of Milton Erickson more than anybody else. Okay. Um, Not to be confused with Eric Erickson. Who, that's right. With the stages right. of development. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, a, a useful, very useful distinction to very, very different people. Okay, so we can just kind of like go back. I'm interested in hypnosis because I kind of like the idea of altered states and what I knew as a child growing up about hypnosis was like, wow, could you really get into that kind of weird state uh, just through hypnosis? Really yeah. interested in all that. And then kind of, I did trainings in hypnosis before I did any trainings in NLP. And then when I did trainings in NLP, I kind of realized, well, actually all of NLP is based on well, not exclusively, because there were other people like Virginia Setier and Fritz Perls and others and others, but the source was really the work of Milton Erickson, uh, uh, solution-focused work, outcome-focused work, and using altered states, the altered state of co unconsciousness mm -hmm. and trance. So, where did all this start? I believe it started with Mesmer. And so... Mesmer was an Austrian physician, trained as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a physical doctor, if you will. Mesmer believed he had discovered a healing force. Yeah. And this force, this energy, he coined animal magnetism. And he believed that the animal magnetism actually originated from uh, the heavens, mm. from the planets, from the movement of the stars and the planets. And he believed that he had found a way of channeling this external force and energy through himself and through people who he could train and teach into people who were sick. This practice became known as mesmerism. But this had very little verbal interaction, is that right? Well, from the sources that are available, we can get a picture of how the work took place and the healing okay. took place and the kind of pictures that we have is that primarily we see that Mesmer were working with people who would have in modern terms psychological problems problems of emotional ill health yeah. mental ill health although well, those terms were not being used in yeah. those days but people for example may have what was known in later times as a hysterical paralysis or hysterical blindness, yep. for example. So Mesmer would see patients individually, but quite quickly he would prefer to work with groups. And as his work developed and became more sought mm. after, 
he began to work more and more with groups okay. of people. He believed certain organic elements, for example, wood or water, could be charged with this animal magnetism, which was the healing force. Yep. And the way in which this took place was simply through him uh, focusing and concentrating on receiving this energy from up above mm -hmm. um, through himself into the wood or into the uh, vessel containing water and he would have the patients sit around usually attached with each other by holding hands mm -hmm. or by some kind of a rope or ribbon or something yeah. which connected everybody and he would then uh, go round individually in turn focusing all of his will all of his concentrating on the individual and their distress and their symptoms okay and um as you quite rightly say, Noel, there were very little conversation mm. as such, mm. but there it was all about focused attention yeah. and uh, communicating uh, a certain uh, expectancy that someone was able and would mm. recover and be better. And what was often happening whether he was working individually or even more so when he was working with groups of patients that people would uh, sit silently they would be in the presence of this great man who had a, an increasingly growing reputation as a successful healer some kind of magician perhaps who could cure people who other physicians and healers were able to mm -hmm. uh, uh, cure um, that they would uh, receive this energy, this force, the animal magnetism, and then what would happen is that they quite often would go through some kind of physical convulsion. Mm. Uh, they would start twitching, or they might even start shouting out or speaking, and that these uh, convulsions would reach some kind of a peak, and then the whole system, the mind, body, the individual, would calm down. And there was a recovery. You're listening to an interview with Tommy Hinkin with me, Noel Bell. Because this is in an era of Carthesian ideas around separation of mind and body. Absolutely. And, yeah. and even predates that. But it was the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment and the scientific area and the whole... Scientific of reductionism. reductionism. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, which is very much part of the story. So, Mesmer becomes very, very, very successful. And anyone who's successful 200 years ago, as is true now, can attract a lot of criticism, becomes a, a political thing as well. And uh, in, in a way, he became too successful um, for his peers and found that uh, he was attracting a lot of criticism from the uh, uh, existing medical establishment. Okay and from the church, etc. And he thought he would go to France, to Paris, which at the time was the revolution, exciting yeah. times, yeah. a place that was open to new ideas. Um, and he began practising there. And again, he became very, very successful. Um, and again, perhaps too successful, because um, the institutions of the time, the medical establishments, the scientific institutions of the time, felt... I believe quite threatened by his success and eventually Louis the 16th decided that a committee would be appointed a commission would be appointed to investigate mm -hmm. his work uh, to see whether in fact it was legitimate headed and, by Benjamin Franklin that's right yeah. and in order to be legitimate there would need to be scientific evidence okay Gosh, doesn't that ring bells when we <laughs> yeah. today? Nice we're talking lines about 200 yeah, years ago. Yeah. When the investigation was complete, the report and the commission concluded that, yes, mesmerism works. We cannot dispute the fact that people come, they receive this treatment, and they get better. Not everybody, but many people mm. get better. Enough for it to be noticeable, for it to be worthy... Uh, of attention but it's not science 
this isn't science. Mm. We can see no physical mm. evidence of what Mesmer is doing. We have no physical evidence of this external force being channeled into the patient. We can't prove it. Therefore, this is not legitimate practice, even though it works. Mm. And again, doesn't that ring bells yeah. with our contemporary scene? Yeah. However, they were great and good men and wise men. And they did say that they believe it works because of three factors. The most important is the use of imagination. Mm -hmm. Mesmer and his um, practitioners would focus all their attention on the patient. Yeah. And they would focus all their attention on the patient's symptom. And they would focus all their attention on the patient's recovery. They would imagine what it was like for the patient to have these symptoms. They would imagine what it was like for this patient to recover. Attunement more than empathy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They would invite their patients, and obviously this would be done verbally, to expect to recover. Mm. They would invite their patients to imagine that they've recovered and that they are well. Mm. Mm. And doesn't this resonate Absolutely. with acting as if... That train driver even... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, join in. <laughs> yes. And the miracle question in St. Lucas Faith, wouldn't it be wonderful if one day you woke up and all these problems and these symptoms that you've had just suddenly disappeared? What would it be like? So says a solution therapist, for example, in yeah. modern times. Yeah. And is that so different to what Mesmer and Mesmerism was developing? The use of imagination. What can be visualised can be realised, can be true. So they were using all of their senses yep. in imagining a recovery. The second explanation of how mesmerism works was given as touch. Mm -hmm. Now, touch was by way of passes, strokes over the subject. Um, and from what I can gather, the passes were often as important as the physical touch. Mm. Now, in contemporary uh, therapy, we have absolutely a whole raft of ethics and boundaries about the possibilities and limits mm. of physical touch in therapy, and rightly so. However, we've always had the healing hand. Acupuncture, massage. And acupuncture. Yeah. And now with emotional freedom technique yeah. or thought field therapy, the use of tapping. And we kind of believe that in some ways this is stimulating some of our neural pathways. And maybe using the model of acupuncture, mm. etc. Um, and all the work of Wilhelm Reich, of mm, course, and mm. bioenergetics and mm. that whole field of mm. body work and how much more we talk now about it's in the muscle and we see the physiological changes yep. as the psychology changes. And again, back in Mesmer's time, the commission was recognising that there is something about physical touch which is part of the healing mm -hmm. process, but it's not science. Mm. We don't know how it works. Maybe it's kind of like alchemy. It kind mm. of works, but yeah. we can't really know how. Yeah. And then the third and the final reason, and remembering that imagination, they said, was the most important, yeah. was imitation. And they believed that the power of working in a group was that people would unconsciously, but that word wasn't around 200 years ago, um, imitate each other so in the group there was this kind of dynamic where my peer who's a patient has just gone through this convulsion and now seems a lot happier and freer mm. and more relaxed and gosh the symptoms disappeared 
that's what I have to do. So it was imitated in the mm-hmm. group. And nowadays, of course, uh, we talk about modelling. And mirroring. And mirroring. Yep. And uh, I know that uh, all the excitement uh, of the discovery of the mirror uh, neuron system is somewhat abated now that we realise perhaps we got a bit too overexcited recently about uh, exactly what the mirror mirror neurons are within the system uh, suddenly discovered this mirror neurons gosh that's everything that's empathy that's how it all works because uh, someone uh, said to me a couple of years ago that, that that's the new cancer transference well it's been so many things have been attributed to the in the rush of the excitement of this discovery of mirror neurons but mirror neurons exist it's just that perhaps we've given yeah. far too much credit to what their function is yeah um, and um, and it's probably a hell of a lot more subtle <laughs> than, than, than we believe we know. But back in Mesmer's time, the commission was saying it's imitation. Yeah. People are, are imitating, they're mirroring and modelling. They're expecting to get better. They're using their imaginations to believe that they can be better. Mm. So all in all, I believe... In 200 years, we're really working with the same elements of imagination, imitation and touch, although so much of the work is boundary. I also spoke uh, and wrote about uh, the work of James Braid, because after after the commission in the late 1700s, Mesmer's work went into some kind of a backwater. It was still continued, Mm. uh, but it wasn't legitimised by the institutions Mm -hmm. so it went into some kind of a backwater but in the 1800s one of the people that was still interested and still maintained uh, a fascination in Mesmer's work was a Scottish physician by the name of James Braid who was the person who coined the term hypnosis right the god of sleep and death hypnosis and he, as far as I can tell, was one of the first people before Freud who talked about states of double consciousness, which then became consciousness and unconsciousness. You're listening to an interview with Tommy Hinken with me, Noel Bell. Because he was challenging uh, Mesmer, wasn't he? Not? That yeah. It wasn't an external force. Exactly it, that, yeah. Noel. Exactly that. In Mesmer's day, this was an energy which was channeled from yep. the external world and the environment. James Braid was equally fascinated with his patients and believed that when he sat with his patients and really devoted and demanded all of his attention to be focused mm. and fascinated, and I use that word again and again and again because that's what he talked about, mm. it's this fascination that you have mm. with your patients. He, he believed he could help with many of their uh, conditions which were originated with a disturbance of their nerves. Um, yep. He found that when he was staring, fascinated with his patients, and the patients could sit there becoming mesmerised with his attention, yep. they would seem to develop into different states. Some, most would actually go into a state where they began to calm physiologically, Mm -hmm. the muscles would relax, the breathing would slow down. Other people, he found a smaller proportion of the uh, the group of people he was working with would develop a state of kind of frozen intensity where perhaps the breathing was even shorter and quicker and there was obviously a physical Mm. tension there but there was this kind of almost a cataleptic-like state. Mm. But he would use this as a means of healing and helping his patients recover. So this eye fixation that he was into, could that be seen as links to deep REM sleep, EMDR? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Ernest Rossi? Yeah. We, now we're in the 1900s and Freud and others absolutely interested in hypnosis. And as I understand it, uh, actually we don't need to induce a trance. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't need to have people 
staring fixatedly at an object, the watch, my eyes, mm -hmm. the spot on the wall, uh, while we guide them into a trance state through this energy. And, and as you rightly pointed out, James Braid was now saying, it's not from the heavens or the planets, it's from within the individual mm. that this energy can come from. This altered state comes from the individual and it comes from two people sitting down together mm. with, a, with a shared fascination in the recovery. Freud, as I understand it, preferred to use free association. We don't need to induce a trance. The therapist, the analyst can sit alongside the patient and the patient can just freely associate and from that we can take the unconscious meanings. So is that why and when Freud abandoned his interest in hypnosis? I believe so, I believe so, yeah. It wasn't necessary. Right, so we're talking then... Early 20th century. Early 20th. And then... Again, hypnosis as such was still in this kind of backwater, despite the work, the wonderful work of James Braid. And there were all kinds of charlatans and stage people and travellers who would use hypnosis for all kinds of entertainment pur purposes, basically. But it wasn't part of mainstream psychotherapeutic work anymore until Milton Erickson in the 40s and 50s and his disciple, if I may put it in that way, was Ernest Rossi. So Ernest, Ernest Rossi, yeah. so he's the chap who has run the, the residential, residential workshops in this country. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you've and obviously seen written, him at first hand. Absolutely. I've spent many, many, many days, many days, many, many times with Ernest Rossi, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And he was able to develop Milton Erickson's work the use of trance, the use of hypnosis, but not in the sense of mm. I am a hypnotherapist and I have this power which will then I will impart into you for you to be cured, but it would be in the way of using a naturally occurring altered state of consciousness that exists within everyone. Because basically what he's talking about is creative psychotherapy. Yes. From Ernest Rossi... We have a, a link from Milton Erickson, we have the link to NLP yeah. and John Grinder yeah. and Bandler. Rossi, when he talked about his four stages of creative psychotherapy, um, having read your article, yes. I've been very yeah. educated, there's a link to the Jungian function. And Rossi originally was trained, he was trained as a psychologist and then as a Jungian analyst. Right, so that's where the connection is. Yeah. All, who sees crisis as a breakthrough. That's right. Which is similar to alchemy in the sense that insight to drop into the negredo, if that's one stage of an alchemical yeah. journey, there's a need for a crisis. Yes. To create an insight. Yes. In order to think there's a problem. And then the 12 steps to recovery yeah. with addicts. Yeah. The first thing it has to accept that there's yeah. a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Powerlessness, unmanageability. Absolutely. And, and, and similar to the work of Wilhelm Reich, mm -hmm. who talked about the creative cycle. Uh, and so we have Rossi's work, we have uh, Reich's work, we have Braid's work, we have Mesmer's work. You remember the convulsions, people would sit there, they would gather, you know, expecting to experience some kind of ritual uh, following which they would recover, they would heal. But part of this was to gather together, to be with someone who they uh, believed had this ability to channel this power. Then they would experience some kind of convulsion, some kind of a crisis, some kind of a shaking, some kind of physical tension, which would be expressed and released and thereafter recover. And if we look at Rossi's creative cycle of healing we look at Wilhelm Reich's mm. uh, description of the creative process, the elements are there there is yeah. a beginning, there is a nurturing, a gathering of information an establishing of rapport and connection with the therapist there is a 
there is an energetic component. Mm. There's some kind of questioning. There's some kind of some challenging. There's something cooking. There's some kind of arousal, an emotional arousal, which then reaches some kind of a peak, as all emotions do. Yeah. And at that peak can come some kind of illumination, some kind of awareness, some kind of sense of accomplishment, some kind of aha, yep. some kind of new way of understanding, yep. a new organisation after the shaking up, after the reorganisation. And thereafter comes a new order, a new balance, a new way of being, a new way of thinking, a new way of acting, a certain calmness, a certain harmony, a certain restoration. And so there is that kind of a, it, this isn't a linear no. progression. It's, it's more ebb and flow. It's more like a wave-like process. Would Rossi follow the symptoms Yes, in fact, one of his uh, earlier publications is entitled, I think, in a, in a kind of breathtakingly visionary way, it's a tough book to read, but read it, The Symptom Path to Enlightenment. Right. It says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You follow the symptom, you stay with the symptom, you accept the symptom, you become fascinated with the symptom in the same way that James Braid was fascinated with his patient's symptoms in the same way that Mesmer was fascinated with his patient's symptoms. You're listening to an interview with Tommy Hinken with me, Noel Bell. To contemporise it, Tom, yeah. where present day we have, and we've alluded to it through the course of the interview, the um, I out six sessions. Yeah. Yeah. How does psychobiology of psychotherapy, which, does, does, well, actually, that's an assumption on my part. Does that necessitate long-term work? No, I, 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 it, it, I, it, it doesn't necessitate long-term work. I, I, I enjoy brief therapy. I enjoy brief encounters. And I have a, a, a group of long-term clients as well who I enjoy as okay. well. Clients fundamentally essentially know whether they want long term or short term they might not know consciously they mm. might not know explicitly but I think if we attend to them closely enough well enough we'll find out so of course it varies and CBT um, brings such popular such easily accessible methods techniques and approaches valuable, valuable. However, I believe our community is already discovering that there's more to it. Yeah. We need a we need a connection. Mm. The therapist and the client need a, a quality connection. Because you're more than a we, we are more than technicians. Exactly. And uh, in my view now psychotherapy is as much an art Mm. as it is a science mm. it just seems as though maybe we are like where we were but of course we are different but we are like where we were 200 years ago where the dominant obsession is with evidence and science at the expense of some of the spontaneity and freedom that comes with some with a more artistic approach but the two things are not in opposition they can live together and be together. But I think we're already finding the evidence that for many people who go through good quality programs of CBT, they also need to have a connection with the therapist, a quality connection with the therapist. They also need to be going into their own creative process, their own healing process, yeah. which comes from within them and from the relationship presumably there's a lot of therapists today maybe working in the NHS who've had to train in CBT maybe not of their choosing yes what does that say for the relationship with the client yeah I, I, I think it can absolutely get in the way yeah um, um, and, and the skills and the qualities that are needed 
to develop a good connection with your client or your patient can be learned yeah. can be taught yeah they don't, they're not this isn't a, a, an expensive resource this isn't something that we don't have time for one question of course um dream work yes <laughs> You ask in that way with that look, and we've only got three minutes. So, what what is it about dream work now? Where I've been trained, there's a whole place CCPE. It's there's a whole dream research institute mm. that mm. looks at dreams from an alchemical, mm. multi-dimensional, multifactorial uh, perspective. Then there's that 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 we come from spirit, and that dreams whilst they can represent something in our day or can resonate with something in our past, spirit can also be revealed through our dreams. Now, that's a very crude, succinct summary. Then there's the psychodynamic, wish fulfilment. So I just wondered, do you allow for dream interpretation? Oh, ab- oh, absolutely no. And, and right now, I, I, I'm... I just wish we had more time. Yeah, um, so that'll be maybe part two. It could be part two, but what I would like to say is that dreams are nature's way of healing, and sometimes we need guidance, and guidance can be very useful. And it's not so much about interpretation or kind of having a fixed schema of what certain mm. Mm. metaphors, images, uh, visions represent that can be interesting but it's it's about using the dream and allowing the dream to do its work which i think is fundamentally a healing work and you probably know don't you that you know the ancient greeks Mm. romans indeed Mm. you know dreaming sleep sleep is nature's natural healing yeah sleep yeah sleep dream and let the body and let nature do what it's there to do yeah and sometimes we need some guidance with that. Because I figured out, and this is the subject for part two, if we have a part two, uh, no, I figured out as, 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 a, as, a, as a child that dreams have a really important part of my life. And wow, what I just dreamt felt as powerful as waking life. Now, how does that work? Yeah. How can that be? And as, you know, my ripe old age of 61 years, I still believe the same. What happens in your dreams is as valuable as what happens in your waking life. Tom, as ever, has been fascinating and inspiring. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it now. Thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Tommy Hankin with me, Noel Bell. For more podcasts, please visit noelbell.net forward slash podcasts.